talk about desperate faith. Desperate faith. And we're going to use Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start with verse 25. And we're going to read the opening text from verse 25 down to verse 34. Matthew chapter 5. We'll start with verse 25. We'll read down to verse 34. Desperate faith. We're going to, we're going to see all these principles that we've talked about. We're going to see all of these principles framed within this very popular biblical story. Desperate faith. Matt, starting with Matthew chapter 5, we will start with verse 25. And we'll read down to the end of, of the story. If, if someone would, please read, read, read these verses for us. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself the power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done this thing. But the woman feared and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Thank you, Brother Barb. Desperate, desperate, desperate faith. All of us know the story of the woman with the issue of blood. It's a common story. How this woman had, 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 had bleeding for all of these years. And how she pressed through the crowd. And in pressing through the crowd, she was able to receive her healing. There is much to this story. Because what's interesting about this story is it's couched between two other stories. Well, well, well they're not exactly two stories. It's one story. And then this story of the woman is sandwiched right in between, right in between. There's a story of, 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 of the ruler Jairus and his daughter who is sick. And the Bible starts off talking about Jesus is on his way to Jairus's house to heal his daughter. And then he is interrupted by this moment of desperate faith. And after Jesus encounters this moment of desperate faith, he continues on to Jairus' house. So it's almost as if this story is kind of introduced to us as a byproduct of another scenario, of another situation. But there is a lot of power and truth when we look at this story. This, this, this story is a story that mirrors the power covenant. This isn't a story about a woman's ability to believe for her healing. It's more than that. It's a story about a woman's ability to believe a covenant promise from God. Let's break this. Let's break this down. Now, first of all, let's talk about the woman's condition and her circumstances. So the Bible tells us that she had a flow of blood for, for, for 12 years, for 12 years. That's a long time. So she has spent all of her money. She went to every doctor that, that you could imagine. She has spent all of her money and yet it got worse. So look at this. So. 12 years of being sick, 12, 12, 12 years 
of having a circumstance that's not changing. She had gone to all of the doctors. She had spent all of her money. She was an outcast from society. There was, a, there was a Levitical law that said that if a woman was bleeding, if a woman, we don't know what the exact condition was, but we knew it was something menstrual, something with her, her uterus. Um, and there was a, a Levitical law that said that while a woman was bleeding, she was unclean. And everything she touched, everything she sat on was unclean. And as a result, anything that came around her was unclean. So she had to be segregated from the rest of society while she was bleeding. This woman for 12 years had a condition that resulted in her, just think, just think for 12 years being isolated being quarantined, being separated from society. For 12 years, she was viewed as being unclean. For 12 years. And the Bible tells us that during that time, she'd went to all the doctors. She went to every specialist. She tried every technique. She tried everything that she knew. God says that she spent all that she had. All that she had. Let that sink in for a moment. Put, put, put yourself, put yourself in her shoes. We, we, we can infer from the story that she had some money. She was a person of, of, of means and a person of substance that she could afford to try all of these doctors. She had an issue and she tried everything she knew. She trusted everything she knew and understood to try to bring about a change in her condition. Think about the, the amount of desperation that must have been in her heart. That for 12 years, she was viewed as an outcast from society. For 12 years, she couldn't go to the cookout. She couldn't go to the barbecue. She couldn't go out shopping at the store. She could not leave her house. She was viewed as an outcast. If she was found out to be out of her house, she could be put to death because she was viewed as being unclean and in violation of the law and be stoned. Think she was desperate? Yeah. But for 12 years, she tried everything she knew. For 12 years, she said, maybe, maybe, maybe my money can get it done. Maybe, maybe man's wisdom can get it done. Maybe, maybe the best knowledge of man can get it done. She turned to everything she trusted to try to get it done. And the result was after 12 years, nothing. Now, I always find this. I always find it interesting when God provides us certain levels of specificity. The Bible, God, God could have told us for a long time or for many years, she had a flow of blood. But the Bible tells us a specific number of years. 12 years. 
Does anybody know what the biblical number 12 represents? It's a completion. Completion. Anybody else? What other 12s do we find in the Bible? Disciples. 12 disciples. Any other 12s? Um, Tribes of Israel. Um, um, 12, 12 sons of, of mm -hmm. Jacob. Jacob, yep. 12 tribes of Israel. Those are the tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. 12 sons of Jacob. God gives us this number for a reason. Mm-hmm. And he could have just said she'd been sick for a long time. That would have sufficed. 12. When she hit the, for 12 years, and it was at the 12th year that she came to a point of desperation that she decided to look beyond what her resources were. The, the, the number 12 speaks to kingdom authority. You see, the reason why there are 12 disciples. If you look in the book of Revelation, each of the disciples are going to rule in heaven. And they're going to rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 is a governmental number. It speaks of divine order. It speaks of kingdom authority. She had been in a condition where she was looking to the systems of the world to try to bring relief to her circumstances. She trusted her money. She trusted the doctors. She trusted everything she knew. I bet in the beginning she said, I got this. My money can handle this. I know the best physicians. I know the best doctors. I, I, I know the best hospitals. I know people. This is good. Got this. We, 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 we can handle this. How, how, how many times you and I have been in a circumstance, in a situation where we said, I got this. My money can handle this. The people I know can fix this. I, I, I got this. Only to find out that it can't bring about the change of condition that you want. This woman had come to a place of desperation. Because she had gotten to the end of trusting everything she knew. Everyone she knew. As some of the old folks would say, she got sick and tired of being sick and tired. Where are you at this morning? What, what, what's your condition? that is requiring God's divine order, God's kingdom authority to come into your circumstances, to come into your life? What is it that you've tried everything that you know, everyone that you know, you've spent your resources, you've tried all the things that you trusted and relied and depended on, and yet still find yourself Wanting. The Bible says she's at the end of her rule. She's at the end of her rule. She couldn't take it anymore. She was tired of being an outcast. She had spent all her money. She was broke. Had nowhere else to turn. Had nothing else to turn to. And the Bible says she heard about Jesus. <laughs> she heard about Jesus. Hmm. And she said to herself, if I can just touch the cloak. And watch this. That's her condition. That's her, that's her point of desperation. Have you ever been desperate? Have you ever been at the end of your rope? Have you ever been at the point where God is the only one that can do it? Have you ever been at the point where your circumstance needs God's divine kingdom order? 
So here's the question. What's up with the garment? What's up with the garment? After all that she's been through, a thought comes to her mind and says, I, you know what I need? I need to touch his garment. Look, 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 look at Mark 5, 27, 28. So I'm going to read our verse for us. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Now, what is that all about? Right? Like, like what? What? Okay. What? Is she so desperate that she's lost her mind? Is, is, is she so desperate that, that she, she has just gone off the cliff in the edge? What is it? about this ideal of touching Jesus's garment, his clothes. What was it? She said, if I, if, if I can only touch it, I can be made whole. What is the deal with the garment? What's the deal with the clothes, what's the deal? Some of it says, some of it, some of your translations may say garments. Some of it may say the hem of his garment. Some may say the corner of his garment. But the idea was there was a connection point that she said, I got to connect with this. I've, I've got to engage this. I've tried all these other things. But if I can just get to this one thing, I'm going to be good. Notice what she doesn't say. Here, look at the text. Anything stand out in there that you would think she would say? What, what, what doesn't she emphasize touching? Like him or his hand. Yes. She doesn't say, man, if I can just listen, if I can just get to Jesus and if I can just touch Jesus, yeah, if I can just get a touch of his hand, mm -hmm. if I can just get to him, I'm, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be okay. Because on the surface here and that, we go, of course, absolutely. Yes, sister, get to Jesus. Mm -hmm. But she gets very specific. Yeah. And she says, it's, it's not him that mm -hmm. I want to get to as much as it is if I can get to his garment. Mm. If I can get to the corners of his robe, if I can get to his claw, I'm going to be made well. What's up with the garment? Mm. What is that all about? Come on. Some hocus pocus, spooky, make it up kind of faith. What is that all about? Is she that desperate? That she making stuff up. Watch this. I want to lay this foundation about this robe because this is the key to this whole story. If you miss this, the story doesn't make sense. Mm. You can look and you can study and you can look at this. And I, I don't, I'm not saying this to point a spotlight on me, but but when you look at how people teach this, they miss the essence of what this story is the corners of his garment. Now, now, now look at, look at, look at, look at Matthew 14, 34, 35, and 36. And this is also in, this is also in Mark 6. But look what this text says, because we're, we're, we're trying to understand what's up with the garment. Because we're talking about a situation of desperate faith. And desperate faith that reaches out to God after I've exhausted all of my other resources. And when she reaches out to God, she reaches out for Christ. It's the robe that is the center of her faith. It is the point of her connection. What's up with the robe? Matthew 14, verse 34, 35, 36. We're going to read these two screens here. And when they, when they had crossed over, they came to the land at 
uh, garrison. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent around to all that region and brought to him all who were sick. So here Matthew's giving a story. Jesus is around. People heard Jesus is in the area, right? They recognized who he was, and they went and they got all the folk that were sick. Yeah. Round up everybody that was sick. Now watch this. Verse 36. And implored him that they may only, man, touch the fringe of his garment. And as many touched it were made well. And I never connected these two. What's up with the robe? What's up man. with the garment? Oh, man. What's up with the garment? Mm -hmm. What's up with the garment? She said, listen, I have got to get to the garment. Mm. here Matthew tells the story Jesus is in town and they go out and they get all the sick people right Jesus doesn't lay hands on him there's other times in the, in, in the gospel where Jesus lays hands on people but in these instances Jesus lays hands on no one they lay hands on the garment what's up with the garment what does that have to do with faith what does that have to do with covenant what does that have to do with God's promises? What's up with the garment? Watch. Hope you can see these pictures on the screen. So, 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 so the Mosaic law of God had instructed his people regarding the corners or fringes of their garments. The Jews were to make tassels on the corners of their garments. God had given them a command. We're going to take a look at this command. But these are pictures of Jews today who still today, Hasidic Jews, Orthodox Jews, they still wear the garment, to the, 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 the tzatziki, right, which is the traditional prayer cloth. You ever see the big prayer cloths? and all the fringes and tassels at the end of the, of the prayer crawl. Yes. And then if you look in the upper left-hand corner, there's a blue and white thread, right? Those were on the corners. That's what it meant by the corner. So you had all of these tassels, but then on the corners of the prayer shawl, there was this special tassels that God had commanded. They wore them in Jesus' day, and again, Orthodox and Hasidic Jews still wear these today. These corners or hems of their garments, of their prayer shawls. Now watch. Numbers 15, 38 and 39 and 40. Let's take a look at what does God say about these garments, these tassels, these corners? What's the relevance of them? Why was the woman so focused on getting to them as much as she was focused on getting to Jesus? Why did, the, why, why did they bring all the sick people to Jesus to touch the hem or the corners of his garment? What's up with the garment? Numbers 15, verse 38. This is God's command. Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. Watch this. And to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corner. The blue thread has to do with the covenant. It has to do with covenant promises. We don't have time to go deep into the blue threads. It'll take us off track. Watch verse 39. And you shall have the tassels that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and to do them. And that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart and your own eyes are inclined. Look at this verse. 
Watch this. Let's go back. Let's not run past this. We go back. God says, put the tassels on the corners of the garments throughout all your generations. Orthodox, Hasidic Jews still do it to this day, right? To put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. The blue thread is messianic. It has to do with the covenant. It has to do with the promises of God. God says, as long as you have this, you will look upon it. And it'll cause you to remember the commandments of the Lord and to do them so that you don't go after, you know, that you don't follow holotry or idolatry, that you don't serve and worship other gods. In other words, that you don't break this covenant agreement that you and I have. And that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy to your God. God tells the nation of Israel that you're to have this garment with the tassels and with the, the special blue and white tassel on the corner so that it reminds you of the covenant relationship that you and I have. So that it reminds you of my promises to you and your obligations and duties to me. So that the tassels represent the covenant promises of God. And it was intended to remind them of this covenant relationship that they had with God. When God spoke of making a covenant with Israel, he gave a picture, an illustration in Ezekiel of him spreading the corners of his garment over Israel as a bride. Watch this. Look at this illustration. I'm going to give it to you in two different translations so that you can see this. Ezekiel 16, verse 8. Someone read this for us, please. When I pass by you again, I can't see this. Ezekiel 16. Now, when I pass by thee, and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou becamest mine. So, so here God, in describing how he made a covenant with Israel, he uses the imagery of him spreading his cloak. On the screen, it says wing, but the word wing in the original Hebrew is translated as covering or as cloak. So that the ideal of God giving a covenant and placing a covenant with Israel is an ideal of him covering Israel under the cloak. Watch. Look, 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 look at it in another translation. He says, later I passed by you and I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love. I spread the corner of my garment. What does she say she needed to touch? The corners of his garment. I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. The ideal of God requiring Israel to have these garments that had these corners on them, that had the tassels with the corners with the blue and white thread, were intended to give the ideal of being covered by God's covenant, being covered by God's solemn oath and God's solemn promise. It was a constant reminder of the people of God, of God's covering for them. And in God's covering them, all of God's promises towards them. See, and for us, without this biblically centered background, it's easy to lose sight of this story 
and to interject all kinds of other things and to, and, and, and to make it pretty and to twist it on that and to twist it on this. But the central essence and theme of the story rests on what did she perceive about the hem of that garment? What did she perceive about the power that rested in the corners of that garment that she said, I've got to get to? I've got to get to that. I've got to connect with that because if I can connect with that, even after spending all of my resources, even after using every tool that I thought was going to fix my circumstances and situation, if I can connect with that, my desperation can be resolved. What motivated her to get to the garment, to get to the tassels, the corners of Jesus' garment, his robe, his prayer shawl that as a Hebrew rabbi he would have worn? What motivated her? What, what, what is it that could have driven her to risk shame? being an unclean woman to be out in public? What, what, what was it that, that, that could have driven her to risk even death to be out in public, bumping up against other people, making them unclean? What was it that fueled her conviction that if she could just touch those tassels on the corners of his garment, she could have her desperation resolved. Being desperate. Yeah. What informed her faith? She had a belief. She had yeah. a belief. If I can get to that, mm -hmm. if I can get to the corners of that garment, I, 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 I can be all right. What fueled her belief. What do you think, guys? We know she was desperate. Yeah. What might have fueled her? When I hear that, the first thing that comes to my mind is that healing is the children's bread, right? Mm -hmm. So I knew she was a child of God or that she was, or either her forefathers were in covenant with God and she wanted to receive some bread, her healing. Come on. So she was she she was being motivated by a promise. Promise. By the she, word of God. Yeah. Because it's obvious she had knew and she would be a descendant of Abraham. So she knew what what God promised Abraham because they passed those down and they taught that. So she understood just like the Jews still to this day. That's why they're blessed, prosperous people. They understand what they have, their heritage is. They understand what's been promised to them. So, 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 so then, so then her, 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 her faith mm -hmm. was driven by her circumstances, but it was informed by what by, she was believing in. Mm -hmm. Driven by her circumstances. Yeah. Formed by a promise. Come on. Let me say that again. Yes, sir. Faith is driven by our circumstances, but it is always informed by a promise because faith can't exist in a vacuum of revelation. Come on. It can only exist where the will of God is known. That's good. What was it? What was it that told her, I, 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 I got to get to the hem of that garment. Watch this. She, she, she knew and perceived that Jesus was more than just an ordinary rabbi. Don't you yes, think? Sir. Yes, sir. She, 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 listen, everybody had perceived that Jesus was more than just the ordinary rabbi. Mm -hmm. Many had begun to believe that he was indeed the promised Messiah. That's right. Some thought that he was the second coming of Elijah. Yes. <laughs> the great prophet. Right? Mm -hmm. now, here's, here, here's, here's, here's something for us to catch. The, 
the people of God in Jesus' day, children of Israel, yeah, they didn't view the word of God like you and I view the word of God today. Come on. For, for, for them, the word of God was everything. That's right. It was the center of their lives. They memorized the Torah. When they were babies, they would take the scriptures and put honey on the scriptures for babies to lick the honey with the ideal that it would create an affinity for, for God's word, a love and appreciation for God's word. They studied the scriptures. They studied the promises of God because the Bible, the scriptures weren't some, they, they didn't view the scriptures as something that was external to their lives. They viewed the word, the promises of God, the terms and conditions of the covenant as being the very essence and center of what their lives, their community, their identity was built on. I'm going, to put, I'm going to put this out. And I tried to find a biblical justification, but I couldn't. But I think when I show this to you, it will make sense to you. She understood and perceived who Jesus was. She understood and perceived that Jesus was the Messiah. Watch. And because she understood and perceived that Jesus was the Messiah, there was something that fueled and kicked in for her. Watch this verse here, this obscure verse in Malachi chapter four. Someone read this verse in Malachi chapter four, verse two. But to you who fear my name, when the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Now, when you read this verse in context, Malachi chapter four, this is the last portion of scripture of the Old Testament. Yeah. This is, this is where it's talking about the return of the Messiah. It's talking about returning back to God. After, after this statement here, it talks about returning unto the Lord. How shall we return unto the Lord? In tithes and offerings. What, what would a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. How have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. And it talks about when, when, when the Messiah comes, when the Son of Righteousness comes. He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the Father before that great and fearful day of the Lord comes. So this verse is in the context of the Messiah. She and others are perceiving Jesus as the Messiah, so they would have been rooted in the scriptures that spoke to and testified concerning the Messiah. Mm. And this verse, which seems so obscure to us, but we can't get the truth out of this story without embedding ourselves in the cultural realities of her day. Wow. She would have turned to this verse. This verse would have informed and fueled the expectation of her faith. This verse says, my name, when the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. This word wings means corners of garment. That's the original Hebrew translation that the King James translators messed up and made wings because they didn't understand the revelation of covenant. Mm. That's why she wanted to get to the corners of his garment. Because there was, a there was a prophetic promise that when the Messiah shows up in his wings, in the corners of his garment, there's healing. She didn't just make up the expectation out of the air. Her faith was fueled. Her faith was informed by the word of God. She knew that if Jesus was the Messiah, then surely if she could just get close enough to touch the hem or the borders of his garment, she said, I can receive my healing. She mm. was embracing the promise that the Messiah had healing in his wings, in the corners of his garments. Could this be what fueled her faith? Could this be the promise that she was willing to risk everything for? 
She was pursuing a connection with the covenant promise. She was pursuing the covenant promise that God had made concerning the Messiah and the healing that would flow from the corners of the garment. It wasn't just faith for healing. It was faith in a covenant promise of the God who cannot lie. Mm. She had trusted the doctors. She had trusted her money. She had tried everything that she thought could bring her the result that she wanted. But when she had came to the end of herself, she was wise enough out of a desperation of faith to turn to the promises of God. Mm. That's just like us. <laughs> we will try everything and everybody. Yeah. <laughs> come to the point of utter frustration. We will try everything and everybody. We'll try to work it. We'll try to fix it. We'll try to connect. We'll try to, we'll try to construct it. We'll try to move it. She had come to the point of desperation because she had tried everything and everyone she knew. And she said, if I can take hold of this promise, that's what she was saying when she said, can I touch the hem of the garment? She was saying, there's a covenant promise. And God is a God that cannot lie. And God said that when the Messiah comes in the corners of his garment, in those sacred tassels that are reflective and emblematic of his covenant promises, that in them there is healing. And she said, if I can get to the place of covenant connection, and if I can touch, if I can engage, in the covenant promise of God, I can receive my healing. Her mm -hmm. faith wasn't in her faith. Her faith was in the God that promised and cannot lie. Mm -hmm. That's why she didn't just say, if I can touch Jesus. She said, if I can touch the hem of his garment. Because she was resting in a revelation of healing that God provided her towards the Messiah, a covenant promise. And she said, I'm going to take him at his word. I'm going to take him at his word. I'm going to take him at his word. I'm going to rest and trust in the covenant. That's good stuff. I don't know about all the other stuff you heard about this story. This is the central essence of the story. It is, it is the picture of a woman who takes hold of a divine covenant promise of God. What do you believe in today? Mm. What do you need from God today? Do you... Mm. Do you think that when she was spending all her money on those doctors, that she, did you think she believed that it would work? Absolutely. Absolutely. When she's spending yeah. all her money on all the her money, yeah. It would work. Don't, 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 don't worry, Sister Cabbage Head. I, I, I know a great doctor. He went to this mm. school. He went to that school. Come on down. We're going to spend money. We're going to go down to see them. I, that didn't work. Come on, sister. We got this doctor. She, and every time she went, I'm sure she was believing and hoping for an outcome. Yeah. Hope ain't enough. Mm. Mm. Hope ain't enough. Cursed is the man whose trust is in man and makes the arm of man, the flesh of man, his strength. Mm. They shall not see good when it comes. What are you trusting in? Mm. What point of desperation is there in your life? Mm. What are you turning to out of the desperation? What are you looking for? It's not enough to just hope for a different outcome. What are you resting in? What promise of God 
are you striving to take hold of this morning? Hers was not an obscure wish. Hers was rooted in the revelation of God's promises. Rooted in a covenant promise of God. And she understood he can't lie. Watch the result. <laughs> Man. And then the Bible says that immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. Immediately. Mm -hmm. She felt her body healed. Immediately. Immediately, when she made that connection with the covenant promise, immediately, she was healed. Immediately, she was restored. And the Bible says, what's the Bible tell us Jesus' response was? Jesus. He, he stopped. He asked, who touched me? He who felt power, virtue leave him he said who touched me watch this oh mm -hmm. man he said i felt power come on leave me you better come on now when she man when she touched the corners mm. when she made faith connection with the covenant promise without jesus's conscious awareness of release power wrong mm. She tapped in. Oh, man. Listen, mm. boy. Woo. Mm. Her faith in the revelation of God enabled her to draw healing without asking permission for it. Mm. Oh, man, you don't get that, boy. <laughs> oh, man. Mm. All of God's promises in Christ Jesus are what? Yes and amen. Yes and amen. Mm. So the answer to God's promises are always? Yes. Come on. So when she went after the corners of that garment, where the covenant promise in Malachi said there's healing, when she touched those corners, guess what the answer for her healing was? Yes. Yes. And amen. And Jesus said, I felt power. Mm. Come I on now. Power come from me. I felt a release. Mm. Why? Why did he feel that release? Listen, guys. Faith makes demands on God's power. Mm. Faith. Mm. It's demands on God's power because God is obligated to respond to his promises. And when my faith is driven and informed by the promises of God, that faith, that trust, that reliance, that confidence, that dependence on the promise makes demands on God's power. Won't he mm. do it? He's not going to do it just because you believe. He's mm. not going to do it just because you're special. He's going to do it because he's a God that cannot lie. Has he not spoken? Will he not do? His mm. word will never return to him void, but it shall accomplish that which he sent, sent it to, it to do. do. Come that, on. that word that said there's healing in the corners of the garment of the Messiah. And when she by faith engaged Touch the corners of that garden. That word was performed. Mm. Yes. Come on. Faith makes demands mm. on God's power. Come on. And the reason why that power was released before Jesus even recognized. Because remember what we said. Faith is spiritual force. Like the law of gravity. When gravity is enacted, what happens? What goes up? Must come down. Down. Right? It's a law. And when faith is enacted, 
there is a law. When faith is reacted, enacted according to the promises of God, rooted in the covenant of God, faith must receive. Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. Man. Oh, oh, oh man. <laughs> Come on now. See, it wasn't faith in her faith. That's right. It wasn't faith in her faith. It was faith in the promises of God. It was faith in the covenant of God. Mm. See, too often we confuse what we hope for with what we should have faith for. Yes. Dave, I got a question. Yep. It's a two-part question. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, Lord, what are you saying to us? And why are you telling us this? And why are you giving this to us? That's one question I have. And two, you know, <clears throat> now in this day and age, that, that when it was recorded, they had more information and were more knowledge of what the word taught. How do you apply this for today where it seems like we have a society who don't know the laws? who don't know what's promised to them, right? And they've gotten so much far away from true teaching. How, how does, how, 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 how would this be able to be manifested in today's society? Well, this will be manifested, you know, first and foremost, mm -hmm. for us who are hearing this word, mm -hmm. to begin to act on this word. Come on. Right? Forget about everybody else. Yes. I, listen, I, I, I got some stuff that I need to get right. In my own life, and my own my own environment, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So 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 let me get let me get to some 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 stuff here, Mark, because this this is going to answer some 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 of your questions, right? Mm -hmm. So so this this goes back to illustrate this whole ideal of the importance and relevance of covenant promises as it relates to faith. That God never asked us to trust Him in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. She had this faith, and it wasn't just informed on her desire and her need. Need isn't enough to inform faith. Amen. He said need isn't enough to inform faith. That's good. Faith can't, act, it can't operate in a vacuum of God's revelation. So what has God promised? said remember when we first started this ministry we provided to everyone those 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 little booklets of god's promises right and then we provided then we provided those those prayers that avail as much which were tend to be like spiritual training wheels for us to learn and understand how to pray the promises of god it, 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 and what this shows us is here mark here, here's here's what you say so, so the question is, how do how do we put this how do we put this thing to work for us? It goes yeah. back to this basic principle again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. God is not a man that he should lie. Mm -hmm. so that's not a Bible verse. That that's got to be a conviction of my heart. Because because if I don't have that as conviction of my heart, I'm in doubt. I'm in doubt. I'm straddled between two kingdoms. What promise has God made that he won't do for us? I got to be convinced that the answer to that question is none. There's no promise that he made that he won't do for us. There's nothing that he said that he won't make good. I got to be convinced of that. To understand is this reality. Faith must be informed by a revelation of God. Where do I get the revelation of God from? The scriptures. That's why I got to be in the book because the book has my terms of covenant, right? You ever buy something from somewhere and they give you, um, they give you a warranty, right? And when yeah. you read the warranty, it tells you all of your rights, all your empowerments, right? That says, if this, listen, if this goes wrong, if this happens, you bring back this warranty and that warranty empowers you to certain rights, that's what the Bible is for us, guys. It empowers and informs us of our rights 
and privileges as citizens of the New Testament kingdom of God in this new covenant. And that should inform what we believe for, not what we hope for, but what we believe for. And here are the basic principles. Biblical faith always acts. It always has corresponding action. Here are the lessons we learned from this. First thing we understand by looking at this story is you got to fight for what you want. What do you want? She wanted healing. She was willing to fight for it. She had used all the wrong weapons. She had used man's wisdom and knowledge, the doctors. And listen, listen, listen to me. I'm not saying don't go to a doctor. That is not what I'm saying. I believe in the wisdom of medicine, but I have more faith in the power of faith and prayer. And when those two are combined, you get a result. She trusted her money. She was using all of the wrong weapons because those things not connected with faith won't bring a result. You have to fight for what you want. And in fighting for what you want, you can't just give in to the circumstances. She didn't just sit back and say, well, I, you know, it's been 12 years. I guess it's going to be 12 more years. She started moving in faith. Faith always acts. Faith always moves. You tell me you believe in God for something, then, then, then there should be corresponding action. I should be able to see something that is evidence of your faith. Every time Jesus commended somebody in the Gospels for faith, he commended them as a result of seeing an action. The Bible will always say, and when he saw their faith. Yes. When he saw the, when they tore the roof off the house and lowered the boy down, the Bible says, when he saw their faith. Yes. If you're believing, if you've got faith and a promise, you need to start moving. Amen. She left her house. She went out in the crowd. She endured all of those obstacles and all of that resistance and pressed through the crowd and risked everything. Faith moves. Amen. You have to be intentional. She was intentional about getting to Jesus. She was intentional about what she was believing for. She didn't have... A uh, 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 scattered shotgun faith. She was intentional with her faith. She was intentional about where she was applying her confidence in the promise of God. Amen. What word of God, what promise are you standing on? What are you standing on? What word did God give you that you are standing on, that you speak to consistently time and time again? And then past failures can, 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 can lead to success. See, 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 some of us believe we failed in faith in the past, so that means we can't move out in faith in the future. That's a lie from the pit of hell. God's not so much concerned of how you arrive to the point of desperate faith as much as he's concerned is what do you want to do once you get there? Because remember, even when we are unfaithful, he yet remains faithful. Yeah. God ain't gonna say, oh, <laughs> girl, listen, for the last two years, you ain't believed me about this thing. Now you're coming to me now. We do that. God ain't gonna do that. Your past failures can lead to success. Your past failures of trusting the wrong things and the wrong people and coming to the end of yourself, that's the very thing that can bring you to the place of desperate faith. Hmm. Last, Man. I'm sorry. Someone had something to say. I'm sure. So, I didn't say the amen. <laughs> so, 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 what does this story teach us? This story reflects the principles of faith that we looked at when we started talking about two weeks ago. Jumpstarting your faith. Hmm. 
What is the principle? That faith is a universal spiritual force. When she operated in faith and engaged the hem of his garment, when she connected with the covenant promises, because she understood that God had to honor and keep his word, she was able to draw power because faith is a spiritual force. God is not a respecter of persons. He's a respecter of faith. It is, it's not the amount of faith that we possess. It's what is our faith in. She didn't have faith for healing as much as she had faith that God would honor his promise of healing. Ah, uh, you, you got to get that. You got to get that. You got to get that. That's why she went specifically after the corners of his garment, because that's where God, by his promise and oath, had made a commitment. What are you standing on? See, a lot of people are standing on the wrong thing, calling it faith. And that's why they don't receive. That's why power is not released. Because faith rests upon God's promises, not my needs or my hopes. And then faith is always fueled by God's word. That promise out of Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, informed her faith. And then lastly, faith is activated, activated by what we say. That's why the Bible gives us the picture. That's why the Bible tells us, and she said to herself, oh. Come on now, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What'd she Praise say? Her, man. <laughs> and she said to herself. Come on, you can have whatsoever you say. And she said to herself. Come on. What you saying? What you saying? What you saying? Mm. What you saying? Ah, oh, this ain't never gonna change. Mm. Oh, this ain't never gonna change. Oh, I mean, what, what, what you saying? <laughs> she said, "If I can but touch the hem of his garment." Come on. In other words, she took Malachi four two and put that thing from her heart to her mouth. That's good. And then she had corresponding action with what she spoke. Come on. That's how faith operates. That's good. That's how she was able to draw power. <laughs> Jesus said, what, what, what the, who, what, 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 so I, I felt power. <laughs> you know, some, some, the, the, there's some of the faith people that teach this. She took her faith. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Like she robbed God somehow. Like she she bogarted God. No, she didn't. She didn't take her faith. Not like that. No. She stood on what God had promised. All she did was take God at his word. Yeah. She took Malachi 4-2 and put it into practice. And the force of faith required God to honor his word it was a spiritual law so that power was released without jesus having to consciously say go ahead sister get your healing so your ability to receive from god don't let no pastor tell you that he's the conduit don't let no man tell you he's the conduit don't let somebody tell you it's based upon whether they lay hands on you or whether you sow a seed of a thousand dollars. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Faith draws power from God because God is obligated to do what his word declares. You think God's going to let some man stand in the way of him keeping his word? And he going to let some man stand in the way as to whether or not there is validity to the unchangeable, immutable nature of his character? Come on, man. That's religion. That's not Bible. Come on, brother. So that's our lessons. That, that's the story of the woman with the issue of blood. It's, it's a story about covenant promise. Mm. It's, it's a story 
about a God that cannot lie. Mm. It's, it's a story of a woman who in the desperateness of her faith, after expending all of her own resources, after utilizing everything she knew and understood, she was left with one resource, one tool, and that was the integrity of God and the promises of God. And she went after it. She went after it and risked everything to go after it. Sometimes, my friend, faith gonna cost you. Come on. <laughs> Sometimes faith, faith gonna cost you. You, you. you might have to be willing to risk some ridicule, ridicule. You, you, you may have to be willing to risk some consequences to walk in faith. I, 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 I bet if she had turned to her home, girl, I, I'm, a, I'm a going out. Girl, you can't go out. Girl, if they catch you going out, girl, you know what's going to happen. Girl, you unclean. Girl, you can't. That's why the Bible says she said to her, self. Mm. Come on, brother. Stop talking to the mother folk because they're going to talk you out of faith. <laughs> you better stop talking to your... You, she said to her self. That is so true. People talk you out of it. I'll close with this. Hebrews 11, 6. Hmm. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. She believed that she'd received. She believed that she would receive. She believed that she would receive not because she believed it. She believed that she would receive because she believed that God was a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. She believed that God would honor his word. She believed in the covenant promises. That's why she said, I want to touch not Jesus. I want to touch the tassels, the corners of the garment. I want to touch the place of covenant promise of God. What are you reaching for? What are you striving to touch? What are you saying to yourself? What do you believe in about God? It's good. Faith is active. It's not passive. And I perceive we are coming into a season where we are going to need faith. We are going to need to depend and to rely on the promises of God. Amen. God is trying to get us ready for what's ahead. Now we, 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 we're, we're way past a year and a half in, in, into this COVID thing. And y'all remember in the beginning, I'd said this. You know, there's a lot of Christians trying to pray this thing away. That's a waste of time. It ain't going nowhere. Stop trying to have a convenient faith. That's not the Bible. But God is shaking everything around us so that the only thing that remains are the things that cannot be shaken. That shaking is going to continue. The instability around us is going to continue. And all the things we trusted, just like she trusted her money, she trusted her doctors. And it wasn't until all those things failed her that she turned to the one thing that will never fail, and that's God, his promises, and his word. That's the point we're coming to. And we need to get ready. We need to get ready. Somebody once said, if you, if, if, if you stay ready, you never need to get ready. Amen. That's the story of the woman with the issue of blood. That's the lesson of faith. What desperate faith can produce. Amen. Amen.